they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home, saying, Don't even go into the village. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do the people say that I am? And they replied, Some say, John the Baptist. Others say, Elijah. And still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, Get behind me, Satan! He said, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. What do you see? This was a question posed to me by a college professor. We were in a class about teaching and group study and uh, ministry stuff in general, and he had taken us to Cornerstone's Hansen Center. It's our big fancy gymnasium. We're in the main auditorium where the main basketball court is. And we're standing up on the track that's built around the top. The bleachers are all tucked in. The basketball hoops are all pulled up. And he asked us, what do you see? Well, we began to describe bleachers, basketball hoops, railing, tracks, Uh, I believe there was the side stand where the announcers would sit and describe what was happening in the game that was down on the court. And we described all of these things. We see these things. And systematically, every single time, my professor said, I don't see it. I don't see that. I don't see that either. If he were here and he asked us, what do you see? And we began to describe this room as chairs, a cross, a pulpit, a sound booth, a TV, lights, he would say, I don't see that. We were incredibly confused. We didn't understand. He was clearly looking for something, an answer that would illuminate us and help us understand. But we did not have it. And it wasn't until one classmate figured it out and spoke up that we finally understood. And I'm going to tell you what that is later. Last time, uh, Jesus talked to the disciples about the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod and said, beware of these things. And the disciples, in their confusion, said, well, he's saying this to us because we don't have enough bread. And if you recall, Jesus, frustrated, said, why are you talking about food? Do you not remember when I fed the 5,000, you picked up 12 baskets? When I fed the 4,000, you picked up 7 baskets. Why are you talking about food? The disciples did not understand. And Jesus even asked, do you not understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see, ears but fail to hear, and you don't remember? Why don't you understand? Now, this leads into one of the more unique healings. We're going to very briefly touch on this healing because this healing is actually, Mark has inserted this story into the gospel as a metaphor for the disciples' experience. Now, this man, I believe, was really healed. But why Jesus healed him in a two-stage healing, which he's never done before and will never do again. So, these friends bring this blind man and beg Jesus, heal our friend. And so Jesus, rather than doing it right there, takes this man somewhere private, 
We don't know if the disciples were there. We don't know if their friends were there. But Jesus and this man go off to have a moment. It says Jesus spits and touches the man's eyes. And he asks, what do you see? Or more specifically, do you see anything? And this man says, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Now, if Jesus were posing the same question my professor would say, he would respond, well, I don't see that. And so Jesus heals the man's eyes again, and this time he can see clearly. Now he doesn't see people looking like walking trees. Now he sees people clearly in all of their detail as God always intended for this man to see. And then Jesus again warns him, don't go home, or go home, don't go to the village. Just stay private. Keep this to yourself. Now this metaphor, is an, this, this story, this healing is an analogy for the disciples' ability to understand Jesus. Right now, they are blind. And Peter is about to make a confession that would seem like putting him in the final stage of healing. But as we'll see, it is actually going to put the disciples in the second stage. They see, but they don't see clearly. They perceive, but they don't understand. Jesus and his mission looks like people, but like walking trees. We don't understand what's going on. So with that story, with this metaphor the Bible provides, and then with this other metaphor, what do you see? And describing things that we physically see not being the answer, let's jump into Mark's turning point. This is the halfway point of Mark. After this, Jesus is going to shift his focus from healing and his authority to his suffering and his sacrifice that needs to come. And so Jesus goes to this area around Caesarea Philippi. Now Caesarea Philippi is a village on the northern end of Israel. And it was a place full of pagan worship. It was a Roman-controlled area as well. And so Jesus takes his disciples somewhere that they have great risk of being honest if they truly do believe that Jesus is the Messiah. You see, at the same time that Jesus is walking around and he's teaching and performing these miracles, Caesar was proclaiming that he was the Lord's anointed one. He was the Son of God, in fact. He was the blessed Savior. Not of the Jewish people, but of the entire known world of Rome. He was an extension of the very gods that Rome served. The Savior, the one they can trust. And to confess anything different was considered high treason. Now, the Jews had special exemptions they had served the Caesar effectively and well in the past. And so they were given some special exemptions to not worship the Roman cult. However, stirring up trouble will still bring Rome's wrath. In fact, in 70 AD, much, many, many, many years after Jesus, the Jewish people stir up so much trouble they create a rebellion. And Rome comes in, destroys the temple, and kicks the Jewish people out of Jerusalem scattering them again. Rome tolerated the Jews, but was not going to put up with them if they caused too much trouble. So confessing something that would be seen as treason is likely not going to go over well, even if you have a pass. And so Jesus, as he's in this region, this dangerous, not Jewish-controlled region, he asks them a very simple question. Who do the people say I am? Who do they see? What do they see? And they say, well, John the Baptist, Elijah, maybe one of the other prophets. These are the rumors that we are hearing. Jesus would, of course, say, well, I don't see that. He responds and says, but what about you? You, my disciples, who have walked with me, who have seen my miracles, who have even gone out and done miracles in my name as I have sent you out. What do you see? And we see Peter make this amazing declaration, you are the Messiah. And it says Jesus warns him not to tell anyone about him. Now, who is Jesus? 
In Jesus' day, there were conflicting understandings of who he was. And I'm going to cover that in a minute because it's more relevant to Peter's rebuke. But who do we see Jesus as? You see, over the years, who Jesus is has been a point of hotly debated contention. Because we Christians claim that he is God. And so if you are another religion or any human on the planet, you have to deal with with that claim. Because if Jesus is God, and Jesus really did come to earth and die for your sins, and raise again from the dead, and raise to God's right hand, well, that causes problems if you don't want to believe in him, or follow him, or worship him. I mean, God himself came to earth. What do you do about that? And so over the years, we've had a lot of confusion about the Messiah. Muslims have thought he was a great prophet. He was a good man. Second only to Muhammad. Until, that is, Christians when it came along and ruined Jesus. Now, this is the Muslim's perspective, right? They believe that we ruined the sacred text, that we at one point did know the truth about Allah, and we ruined it by deifying Jesus. Now, we as Christians know that's not true. Christ is God. He is very much who he says he is, who he has shown himself to be. But, in the Muslim's perspective, he is a great prophet that we ruined. Jehovah's Witnesses believe he is an exalted created being, specifically, typically Michael the Archangel. That's who they say Jesus is. Some, some just general people over the years have said he was a great teacher of wisdom. He said good things, things we should probably do, but that doesn't make him God. That doesn't make him anyone we have to follow or trust or believe in. But even Christians are not exempt from misunderstanding this role. Recently, there has been a big rise in the prosperity gospel. If you've never heard of this before, the prosperity gospel believes that God cares about your happiness, which we should affirm, of course he does. He does care. But he also cares about your financial well-being too. So much so that the prosperity gospel says that God wants you to be happy, healthy, and wealthy. And many of its teachers say, if you just give me a donation, God will bless you. Unsurprisingly, many of these prosperity gospel teachers are absolutely filthy rich. The prosperity gospel is a heresy, to be clear. Jesus does care about our happiness and our health. But God is not above leading us through what his son had to go through. God is not going to protect us from our own consequences. And ultimately, God is not going to just give us wealth because we want it or we deserve it. Because the truth being, we don't deserve anything other than death for the sins that we have committed. The prosperity gospel has been one of the more destructive, heretical gospels that have come out in recent years. Because it has led people to believing a lie about God. To give money to these people who, uh, they may or may not care. I've seen some varying reports on, on the actual, like, people behind the prosperity gospel. But the prosperity gospel has no grounding in reality. To give you an example from scripture, Paul himself talks about the thorn in his flesh. And if God cares about our health and our happiness, why would God not remove this thorn? And yet Paul very clearly says, God didn't ever remove my thorn. I suffered for it. If God cared about our health and our happiness, why did he allow martyrs to be a thing through all the years of Christian history? In fact, today, there are more martyrs for the faith than at any other point in history, which... To be fair, there are also more Christians at any other point in history, but persecution seems to be going up for Christians. And if the prosperity gospel was true, we should see the opposite. Persecution should go down for Christians, and yet that is not the case. You see, the danger that Christians get into, like anybody, is we want to have an idea about who Jesus is. And because of our sinful, broken nature, sometimes when we go to Scripture— 
we already have an idea of who Jesus is, and then when we read the text, we only really remember or focus on the parts that affirm who we believe Jesus is and what he's about. And we ignore or disregard or question the authenticity of the parts that challenge our perception of Jesus. This is the same problem the world around Jesus was in. Who is this great man? But who is Jesus really? You see, Jesus wants to answer this question immediately. Verse 31, I'm going to read this verbatim. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. Verse 32, he spoke plainly about this. Jesus, up to this point, especially if you read Matthew and Luke, has been using parables constantly. Illusions, different metaphors, the yeast of the Pharisees and Herod. Jesus wasn't clear there with the disciples. That was a parable. It was a a metaphor, an analogy. Yet here, when Jesus very clearly lays out this is exactly the mission of the Messiah, that I must suffer many things, be rejected by my own people, be handed over by the teachers of the law to be killed, and then three days later rise again. He spoke plainly about this. There was no confusion. The disciples knew exactly what he meant. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. This is bold on Peter's part. Rebuking is to tell someone off. So you have to imagine Jesus is with his disciples and he's saying, I have to die. But that's not the end of the story. I'm going to be raised up. And Peter says, Jesus, come here, come here. I'm going to talk to you for a second. Pulls him aside. Stay over there. Stay over there. Stop saying this. You can't talk like this, Jesus. This is inappropriate. This is wrong. This is maybe even borderline sinful for you to talk like this. So what's Peter's hang-up? If we believe that Jesus is who he says he is, and he has confirmed that he is who he says he is through the miracles that Peter saw, the healings, the, the feeding of the thousands, the, the rebukes of the Pharisees, the calming of the storm. Jesus has demonstrated that he is who he says he is. And yet when he says, this is my mission, to die and come back to life, Peter rebukes him. You see, in Jesus' day, there were some conflicted understandings of the Messiah. For Peter and many Jews, they believed that the Messiah, that Jesus, Jesus, they believed that he was going to be a military Messiah. Because they heard the Old Testament writings that the Davidic line was going to be restored and established forever and all of Israel's enemies would be crushed and defeated. And they thought, you know, Rome seems to fit that bill as an enemy. We don't have control over Israel, the promised land of God. We don't have full free religion to worship God. We have to work with Rome, which many Jews despised and loathed and hated. So certainly Jesus, if he is the Messiah, as Peter confessed, is going to build up an army, march on Rome, and crush them, take back Israel for God, establish the Davidic line forever. But what none of those Jews, and Peter too, failed to understand, what they failed to understand is that the enemy of Israel is not Rome. It's not even necessarily sickness and disease, but it's sin. It's death, Satan himself. Which makes Jesus' reply to Peter so biting. Get behind me, Satan. Could you imagine? It says Jesus turned and looked at his disciples. So Peter pulls him aside, right? Over here. And he rebukes Jesus. And Jesus turns away from Peter. Or maybe he turns so Peter is in his peripheral. And looks at his disciples and says, Get behind me, Satan. Could you imagine 
what the rest of the disciples must have been thinking when Jesus just called Peter Satan. Well, that's not good. So the last time Satan came up in Mark, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were accusing Jesus of removing demons by the power of Satan. And now here's Jesus employing some, not the same logic, but the same word against one of his disciples, who Jesus says, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. You're worried about a nation and boundaries and security on earth. But that's not what I'm about. See, many uh, Jews post Jesus' resurrection were very confused about Jesus still. You see, they believed that maybe Christians made up this messianic hope in Judaism. There was really never supposed to be a Messiah. The Sadducees would fall into this line. See, they weren't concerned about resurrections. They weren't concerned about a Messiah. The Sadducees were very happy with their political power they had gained. They were comfy and cushy with Rome. And they had some power and influence. Why rock the boat, right? But there were others who believed that any Messiah would be instantly recognizable by all Jews, period, if it was the real Messiah. The truth is obviously between those two. Jesus is real, the real Messiah, but not every Jew recognized him as such. You see, Jesus' role is to suffer. As I said, Jesus himself is not here to make us comfortable, to make us happy, but to suffer on our behalf. And what we're going to find out next week when we continue this story is that there is a model for Christian life that is shaped after Jesus' mission, which is what makes it so tempting to come to the Bible and say, well, surely Jesus is not actually about suffering. Surely he's about anything else. Sin blinds us. Like the man that we saw in that first story, this analogy that Mark put in to explain the disciples. See, was Peter's statement about Jesus correct? Yes and no. You see, Peter's eyes were open, but he did not see Jesus clearly. A tree, just blurred, uncomprehending, confused. What is Jesus about? Because I think I understand, and when I rebuke Jesus for not even understanding his own mission, he rebukes me back and calls me Satan. You can imagine probably the confusion on Peter's face, too. What do you mean I got it wrong? Well, we, we read the scriptures. This is what it says. It takes two steps for the disciples, and oftentimes for us too, to be fully healed. We're in fact in the first step. Now the Holy Spirit has come and he has opened our eyes to the things of the Bible, the, the truths of the gospel, but we are not healed yet. Sin still lives in our hearts even though Christ reigns. And until he returns and eradicates sin, we are always going to struggle to fully understand or obey the will of God. My professor, I talked about at the beginning, asked that question when we were in the gymnasium. Let's pretend he's here with us. And he says, what do you see? Well, the answers that we gave in the beginning of the sermon are a lot like Peter's answer. Well, you are the Messiah. Yes. But Peter, you don't have it quite right. I don't see what you see. The answers he was looking for in that gymnasium, the answers that he was, my professor was looking for here, were not the physical objects we see, but instead they were things like this. I see a space where people can come together and support and love one another. I see a space where the word of God can be proclaimed, where people can feel safe and comfortable. I see a space where we can hold monthly fundraisers with breakfast for our community so they can come together and, and eat a good meal and enjoy each other's company. I see a space where counseling could happen, where people who are broken can come and find hope and peace. In that gymnasium, it was, I can see a space where kids can come after school, play some sports, stay out of trouble. 
I see space where we could hold a rally or a concert of some kind to encourage the hearts of people who attend. See, my professor was looking for how we could use that space for ministry. And Jesus, in asking a similar question, who am I, who do you see, is looking for us to say, our Savior and Messiah. The one who died for our sins and rose again. Not a great prophet, a wise teacher, Michael the archangel. The Savior who brings us wealth and prosperity. Jesus doesn't see and is not any of those things. Instead, Jesus is the very one who came, bore our sins on a cross, rose again from the dead. So that we might have life and life everlasting. And if you want to know what Jesus defines as the life of one who follows him, read Mark, the next section, and come back next week where we'll talk about it. But it does involve suffering. It involves self-sacrifice. It involves humility. Because to follow Jesus means we must live like him. And Jesus did not give himself wealth and prosperity, but as Paul tells us in Philippians, rather, Jesus gave up wealth and prosperity. He gave up worship to come to earth, the form of a human, to die the worst possible death, a death that destroys your name and tarnishes your reputation for all eternity. And then from that point, Christ was then exalted again back to where he belonged, where he gained his wealth and his status. Yes, but only after he sacrificed everything, only after he humiliated himself and humbled himself to the Father's will and the Spirit's leading while he was on earth. Christ's mission is to die. And our calling is to live like him, to die to ourselves so that we might love and serve the people around us better because that is what Jesus sees and what Jesus wants to see in us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your word. But more than that, Lord, we ask that you would challenge us with your word this morning. Lord, if we do not understand, if maybe we resist the calling that you have placed on our lives, the calling that does lead to suffering, the calling that does lead to giving up things that we want or things that we maybe even think we deserve, Lord, we ask that you would challenge our hearts to see and recognize how your Son has given up everything for us. That we would see and recognize how we can model that for our friends and our neighbors and our loved ones. That while we might not be called to physically die, and that is a blessing we have here, Lord, thank you. We are called to give up ourselves, to lay down our desires for the sake of others. Lord, I pray that you would challenge our hearts to make that a reality. Challenge my heart when I fail. Challenge me, Lord. Challenge this church to be a church that models the life of Christ, the life of self-sacrifice, love, compassion, and patience. Thank you, Jesus. You gave us the opportunity to even be challenged in this way. We just ask that you make us more and more like your son. Make us more righteous. Make us more holy. A holiness that does not breed arrogance, but rather humility. And thank you that you have sent the Spirit to guide us on that path. We are not alone in that journey, Lord. Thank you for that too. Father, it is in your Son's name that we pray all of these things. The Son who made it possible to pray to you. Amen.